Oh, good evening. Welcome to Click Bible Study. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Dear Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we can come into your presence. We thank you for your inspired word. Your word, the Bible, is your word. You are the one that cannot lie or fail or forget or make a mistake. You are a mighty, eternal and changing God. So we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your presence. We thank you we can worship you. We thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence and being able to pray to you. And we do so through the precious blood of Jesus, your Son, our Saviour, the one who has paid in full for our salvation. So, Lord, as we come into your presence this evening and through your Holy Spirit, speak to our lives. Help your word to become more real and more living within our hearts. And Lord, forgive and remove anything you see as wrong. And hear our prayer now for Jesus' sake alone. Amen. This evening we're going to carry on looking at stories of the kings of Israel and Judah. And tonight we're going to look at a king called King Uzziah. Our study tonight is going to be in 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Before we begin, I want to ask you a question. How do we measure success? Most of the time we measure success in our achievements, don't we? When you were younger, it's your exam grades at school, how many GCSEs you got, how many O-levels you got, whether you went to university, whether you got a degree, what grade were your exams? And as you go through life, things like our position at work, if we've had a successful career, we've someone have climbed the ladder and got promotion. Success sometimes measured in our home we live in. Sometimes to live in a big posh home is a status symbol of how successful you've been. It's about how much money you've got in the bank. Success can be measured in the influence and effect you have on society around you. Success can be measured in titles that you've got to your name, letters you've got after your name. Success can be measured in sporting terms and the trophies you've won and the titles you've won and the medals you've won. And we hear people talk about someone having a successful career. Or we hear someone's life being called a success story. So how do you measure success? a king or queen or ruler quite often we talk about whether their reign was or their term in office was a successful one or not don't we what makes them successful though what makes a ruler or a leader a success is it their power is it measured how much power they've got is it measured in their wealth is it measured in the amount of victories they won is it measured in how safe and secure their country is yes in the eyes of the world it is isn't it if a ruler rules over, wins the victories, the battles he has to fight, whether that is physical military battles or whether that is battles over issues like the dealing with the EU or in this present situation, coronavirus. I mean, Boris will be measured in how successful he is in dealing with the situations he's facing, wouldn't he? All rulers are measured looking back through history of how successful they are and how safe and secure the country is they ruled over. So in the eyes of the world, you would say that these are the sort of things we look for for a successful ruler. But this evening, as we turn to 2 Chronicles 26, I want to look at King Uzziah. And I want to look at his life and I want us to ask, our six lives, ask ourselves, was he a great king? How successful was his rule? Was his rule a success? Would you put him down in history as a great king, a successful king or a not so successful king? Because your history, as we look back, we analyse the good and the bad, can't we? And we analyse how successful we think someone is. And this evening, I want us to do that with the life of King Uzziah. And it all started with Uzziah being in a very vulnerable position. The way his kingdom started was very deja vu from his dad's life before him, King Amaziah. King Amaziah became king when his dad, before him, King Joash, was assassinated. And Uzziah's reign starts exactly the same as his dad's. If you listen to what it says in 2 Chronicles 25, verse 27. At that time, Amaziah, that is Uzziah's dad, turned away from following the Lord. And the people made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem. And he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and they killed him there. And they brought him on horses and they buried him with his father in the city of Judah. Now, all the people of Judah then took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king instead of his father, Amaziah. So he starts off becoming king at the age of 16, after his dad is assassinated. The people of Israel, Judah, had lost all confidence and faith in him as a king. 
He'd failed, he'd started so well, but it had gone downhill so fast. He was beaten, he was defeated in war, he was humiliated, his country was humiliated, and the people that had just had enough in being king. So 16 year old Uzziah is made king. Not the best start, is it? To make king by people that you are obviously very worried are gonna turn on you in the same way as they did your dad. If you don't measure up and you're not a good king, are you gonna end up being assassinated? Look down at verse three with me. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehola of Jerusalem. First thing we see is that Uzziah's reign was a long one, 52 years. So by the time he died, he was 68. So he reigned a long time. He wasn't assassinated like his dad or his granddad. His people loved and respected him. They never got fed up of him. They never lost their confidence in him. But he did, his dad. So first of all, tell us something about his reign. It is successful. To reign 52 years and your people to still respect and love you. It's a sign of respect. It's a sign of success, isn't it? Look at verse 4. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all his father Amaziah had done. Like his dad Amaziah before him, Uzziah wanted to be a good king. He did what was right in God's sight. But then so did his dad and then it all went wrong. What is the difference between Amaziah and Uzziah? Look at verse 5, it gives us the clue here. Amaziah, Uzziah sought God all the days of Zechariah who had understanding the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Last week we saw Amaziah, he did what was right in the Lord's eyes, but he never loved God in his heart properly. He didn't have a real relationship with God. So was, he wanted to be a good king, he wanted to do the right thing, but he was trusting in himself. He was trusting his own strength to do it. And like every human being, like all of us, there comes a stage when the wheels come off the wagon, things go wrong and we make mistakes. And when that happened, Amaziah had no one to turn to. He wouldn't listen to the voice of God anymore. But you know, Uzziah is different. We're told here that rather than not loving God, that he sought God. And that is so different. He didn't try to be a good king. He didn't try to be a success by doing the right thing, trusting his own efforts. No, he turned to God and he sought God. Sought God, and we read there that God blessed him, and God made him prosper. So Uzziah's heart is right with God. Fundamentally, there's something very different about Uzziah being king than it was with his dad. He is trusting God. So what happens? Well, let's look at verse six. Uzziah went out and he made war against the Philistines, and he broke down the wall of Gath, the wall of Jabba, and the wall of Ashdod, and he built cities around Ashdod and among the Philistines. God helped him against the Philistines against the Arabians who lived in Carbale and against the Munites. Also the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah. His fame spread as far as the entrance of Egypt for he became exceedingly strong. Uzziah defeats the Philistines. He defeats the Arabians. He receives tribute from the Ammonites. He is military success. How? We're told in those verses that God helped him. He sought God, God heard his prayer and God helped him. God made him, we're told in those verses, exceedingly strong. His fame is growing. Other nations are hearing of this great young king. It's hearing his victories he's winning, of hearing how God has blessed him. This king is achieving success. This king is making the world stop and look. Why? Because a new young king has put in his trust and his plans in God's plans and in God's way. And God blesses him and God blesses Judah through him. But Uzziah is only just starting here. Look at verse nine. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem and the corner gate, at the valley gate and the corner buttress of the wall. And he fortified them. He refortifies Jerusalem, the capital city. You remember in his dad's reign, how the king of Israel come and destroyed part of the wall and broke down the defenses left Jerusalem vulnerable and weak. Uzziah does the opposite. He strengthens the walls. He makes the tower stronger. He, he fortifies the city. He makes it impregnable. He wants his people to feel safe. He wants his people to be secure. Verse 10. 
He also built towers in the desert. He dug many wells, for he had much livestock, both in the lowlands and in the plains. He had farmers and vine dressers in the mountains and in Carmel, for he loved the soil. This king is concerned about the whole welfare, not just military success, but the feeding of his people, looking after his people. He builds wells and farms. His people are going to be safe. His people are going to be fed. Verse 11. Moreover, Uzziah had an army of fighting men who went out to war by companies, according to the number of their role, according to them as prepared by Jehoel the scribe, and Mishael the officer under the hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains. The total number of chief officers of the mighty men of valor was 200, sorry, 2,600, and under their authority was an army of 307,500 that made war with mighty power to help the king against the enemies. His army is organised. His army made war. We're told of mighty power. This army is inspired by their king. They're inspired by their God. And this army is strong and it's powerful and it's organised and it's winning victories. But not only that, this army is prepared. He supplies what his army needs. His army is equipped. Verse 14. Uzziah prepared for them. For the entire army, shields, spears, helmets, body armour, bows, slings to cast down. He cares about the life of his men. He wants them protected, he wants them equipped, he wants them safe. This is not some king sending his men out to just be massacred, sacrificed as pawns on a game of chess. No, this man cares about the safety and the health of his soldiers. He sends them out not just with weapons to fight, but with armour to protect themselves. Verse 15. He made devices in Jerusalem, invented by skilful men to be on the towers and the corners to shoot arrows and large stones. So his fame spread far and wide, for he has marvellously helped till he becomes strong. He uses technology here to build state-of-the-art weapons, catapults, to launch stones and arrows and other missiles from the walls. He makes Jerusalem impregnable. He does everything possible to make his nation safe, his people safe, his people secure, his people fed. So what is success? How do you measure success? King Uzziah seems right up there, doesn't he, with King David and King Jehoshaphat. How did he achieve his success? The world is stopping and the world is looking at his King Uzziah and the world is rubbing its eyes and thinking, I can't believe what I'm seeing. After what's gone before of his dad and his granddad, this country is real. This country is living. This country is going places because its king is. How did he achieve his success? Look back again at verse 5. In verse 5 we read, As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Verse 7, God helped him against the Philistines and the Arabians. His fame spread and he came exceedingly strong. Verse 15, he was marvellously helped. These are strong adjectives, aren't they? They're describing immense blessings from God here. Immense victories through God. Immense strength and fame and success through God. Always through God. These were God's blessings on Uzziah and on Judah because he sought God first. He had achieved far more than his dad or his granddad ever did. He not only did what was right, but he actually sought God. He trusted God to be a good king, not one where he trusted his own efforts to be a good king. He knew what David knew. You know, David wrote about his relationship with God a lot in the Bible. And in Psalm 34, we read these words, Psalm 34, verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord me. Let us exalt his name together. Listen to this. I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They look on him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man, he cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamped all around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints. There is no want to those who fear God. The young lions may lack and suffer hunger, but those that seek the Lord will not lack any good thing. David knew the truth of those words. He knew his strength came from God. It was God that he honoured and respected and feared. It was a relationship with God that meant more to him than anything else. And you know, Uzziah knew the truth of that word. He sought the Lord and the Lord heard him. He trusted the Lord and the Lord delivered him. 
in his weakness and vulnerability as he started as a young king at 16, with risk of assassination like his dad and his granddad, he sought God. And when he did, God blessed him. God made him strong and secure. No one is ever going to talk about assassinating Uzziah. Humanly speaking, from a political point of view, from a military point of view, from a physical and financial point of view, this man is a success story because he sought God. But do you remember what Paul wrote? We looked at this as well last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 14. 2 Corinthians 14, Paul is looking back over his life and he also had some situations he really struggled with and he wanted God to take the problem away and remove it completely and God didn't do that. But he sought God and this is what God said to him. In 2 Corinthians 14 verse 9. God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, says Paul, the more gladly I'd rather boast in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul said, God didn't take all my problems away. God wanted me to trust him. So he allowed those problems to stay. So that rather than trusting myself, I trust him. When I am strong, weak, then I'm strong. When I'm struggling and my faith is in him, that's what makes me great. And you know, the same as Uzziah. When he was weak, when he was vulnerable, he put his trust in God. And that's what made him strong. That is where his secret of success really lies. In his weakness, Uzziah trusted God. And in God, he was strong. But then there's another side to the story, which you now come to in verse 16 to 18 of 2 Chronicles 26. Verse 16. When he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he transgressed against the Lord his God by entering the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. So Azariah the priest, so Azariah, sorry, the priest went after him, and with him were eighty priests of the Lord, valiant men, and they withstood King Uzziah. And they said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but that's for the priests, the sons of Aaron alone, who were consecrated to burn incense. Get out from the sanctuary. For you have transgressed, you shall have no honour before the Lord. Uzziah, in his pride and success and strength, got to a stage where he started to think that he could do whatever he wanted. Yes, he loved God. He went to the temple to worship God like David did. And he thought, well, if I'm here worshipping God, then there's no reason I can offer incense as a sacrifice to God. Something that God had specifically said right back in the Levitical law was a job for the priests descendants of Aaron, the first high priest. They alone were consecrated. They had to wear certain clothes. They had to go through consecration ceremonies first before they come into the holy presence of God. For anyone that wasn't a priest to do this was wrong, even if they're the king. But Uzziah didn't quite see it like that, did he? He thought, I love God. I sought God. God's blessed me. God has been good to me. God's made me strong. Surely I can do this. And his pride led him into making a mistake. Uzziah and his pride had just broken God's law. But we all slip, don't we? We all make mistakes. We aren't perfect. Uzziah is no different to you and me. We saw last night Amaziah. Last week, sorry, Amaziah made a mistake and stopped trusting God and started worshipping idols. We saw Joash make a mistake the week before when his uncle was no longer there to help him and turned away from God. Even Jehoshaphat, we looked at his life, and David made mistakes. We all sin, the Bible says, and pride is often the downfall of many of our sins. Right back Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Initially, they were tempted by the devil to doubt God's goodness, to doubt God's faithfulness, and this carrot is dangled. If you take the fruit, you will be like God. And it worked. And just so often pride, human pride, leads to our downfall and our disobedience and our rebellion to God. And as we said last week, we all sin all make mistakes but what is different is our response to God's warning in his word and that's what defines our relationship with God. We saw last week David's confessions and repentance in Psalm 51 didn't we? In response to God's warning and how his relationship with God is restored. We've seen as we looked at King Jehoshaphat the mistakes he made in his life when he got too close to King Ahab and it caused problems in his family and nearly cost him his life. How when God speaks to him, he turns away and renews his effort to lead Israel back to God and God's law. 
It's almost like he's saying, I've learned from my mistakes. This is God's law, people. Don't make the same mistake as I made. Come back with me to God. See, David in Jehoshaphat's response is a response of someone that loves God. They listen to God's justice. They listen to God's warning. They listen to God's condemnation of their sin. And they see sin for what it is and they turn from it to their great God and seek his forgiveness and mercy. In contrast, we've looked at King Amaziah and King Joash and we've seen both of them refuse to listen to God's voice. They refuse to obey God's voice. Even threatened or killed God's messengers. So how about Uzziah? What's King Uzziah going to do? Look down at verse 19. And Uzziah became furious and he had a censer, incense censer in his hand to burn incense. And when he was angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of the Lord because of the incense altar. And Amaziah, the chief priest and all the priests took him, looked at him. And there on his forehead he was leprous. So they thrust him out of the place. And he indeed hurried to get out because the Lord had struck him. Now King Uzziah was a leper unto the day of his death. He dwelt in an isolated house because he was a leper, for he was cut off in the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land and ruling his dad's position. The rest of the acts of King Uzziah, from first to last, the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, wrote. So Uzziah rested with his fathers, and they buried him with his fathers in the field of burial which belonged to the kings. For they said, he is a leper. Then Jotham his son reigned in his place. It's human pride here. Like so many great successful people got in the way. He could not admit his sin. He could not accept humbly God's warning. He could not turn to God in repentance. His pride and success was his downfall. When he was weak, then he was strong. But now he is strong. Really, he's weak. His trust is now in how important he is and how successful he is and not in God. See, true Christianity is about a relationship with God and our Heavenly Father through the sacrifice of Jesus, God's Son, in our place. When we were held deserving sinners with no hope and no future, it was only what Jesus did that made a difference. We were weak, hopeless, helpless. He alone was good enough to pay the price of sin. His sacrifice of his life alone could cover our sins and pay the price in instead of us. We have forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, an inheritance with God, a relationship with God through Jesus and through him alone. And to become a Christian, we have to realise we are weak and he is strong. That he can do what we can't do and he's the one and only way of salvation. That's why God so loved this world. That's why God sent his only son that we believe in him, him alone. That's where our hope must be. We shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, you take away our relationship with God, what are we left with? An empty religion. If we take away our Saviour and what he's done, and trust in him what he's done, and trust in his goodness and his sacrifice, and his love and his promises for our forgiveness and salvation, if we take all that away, what have we got? We've got an empty religion like every other religion in this world, where our, our efforts are all we've got. And we have to trust in what we can do. And you know and I know that that's not good enough. We are in a vulnerable position again, no matter how strong we think we are. Uzziah had achieved so much of his trust in God. Judah's hope was in their king. Judah's hope was in their king's relationship with God and it had made him a success in the eyes of the world. And you know, this king still, even as a leper, was someone that the people loved and treasured because of all he had done for his people. How sad that the remaining years of his life were spent living in isolation as a leper, while his young son, Jotham, ruined in his place. Do you know, it still had an impact on his Judah, even when he died. Isaiah the prophet was affected by his death. We read these words in Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it were seraphim, and one each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and they cried out to one another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cries out, 
and the house was filled with smoke, and I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a living coal which he has taken from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it, and he said to me, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, your sin is purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Send me. Isaiah, like the rest of Judah, was impacted by the life of this great king. This success story, humanly speaking. And when Uzziah finally died, Isaiah perhaps is feeling a bit insecure and he goes to the temple. The temple, the very temple where Uzziah went and in pride tried to do what any priest should do. Where he actually defied the holiness and purity of God. And Isaiah went to that temple. And he saw a vision in that temple of God and all his holiness and all his glory. With the angels continually saying, holy, holy, holy. The very thing that King Uzziah's pride wouldn't acknowledge. And as Isaiah saw the greatness of God, he hears God speak and he hears a temple shake. And he realises that this is God and that God's the real king. And God is the one that gave Uzziah that success. And God is the one that is on the throne. And there it's God calls Uzziah, Isaiah, to be his witness, not just in the reign of Uzziah, but for the reign of the following three kings as well. You know, Uzziah may have achieved greatness and success in his world's eyes. But what he forgot, the very thing that Isaiah the prophet saw in that vision, was the thing that Uzziah the king, he confused the two names here, forgot, was that his greatness and success was achieved for seeking and trusting God. It wasn't about himself. It wasn't about human effort. How sad when we allow our eyes to turn from God and trust ourselves instead. How sad to be so concerned that we're right and our way is best that we stop listening to God and we stop trusting his word and we stop obeying his law. What is really reassuring really is that although pride may be our downfall so often, it was never the downfall of our Saviour. He was truly the King of Kings. He was the one whose glory filled the temple. He was the one whose voice shook the pillars in that temple in Isaiah's vision. But he's also the one we read of in Philippians 2 where it says this, Let his mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who was in the form of God, but did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, because he was. But he made himself of no reputation and took the form of a bondservant and come in the likeness of men and been found in the appearance as a man he humbled himself and become obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross therefore god has highly exalted him and given a name that's above every name that at the name of jesus every knee shall bow of those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that jesus christ is lord to the glory of god the father our savior didn't cling to power to his greatness, to his success, although he had it all. Instead, he humbled himself. The thing that Isaiah, you, sorry, Uzziah would not do in that temple. He humbled himself, even to the death of the cross. And he won the greatest victory, the greatest success, the ultimate victory over our sins forever. He truly is the greatest king. His reign is real greatness. True victory, true greatness is found in him. True success as he tri cries in triumph on the cross, it's finished. Sin is paid for completely. God's justice is totally satisfied. Can we learn this evening from Uzziah, the king? To trust in him, in our great God. Not in ourselves, not in our human pride. Can we like David and can we like the Apostle Paul really say what Paul wrote? back there in 2 Corinthians 14 when I am weak then I'm strong my strength is made perfect in his greatness I will trust in the Lord for all my heart and lean not to my own understanding that was how I was saved that is how I became right with God in the first place that is how he became my heavenly father and that is how I must live every day be like my saviour let go of pride 
Be like David and the Apostle Paul and acknowledge and realise that true success and true greatness is found in trusting God with all my heart and not leaning to my own understanding. As you close, I want to read you the words of a hymn. A hymn that could have been David's cry, could have been the Apostle Paul's cry. Sadly, in his later years of King Uzziah's life were probably more like something of regret. Listen to these words. All I once held dear and built my world upon. All this world reveres and it wars to own. All I once thought gain, I've counted loss. Spent and worthless now compared to this. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now my heart's desire is to know you more, to be found in you and known as yours, to possess by faith what I could not earn, an all-surpassing gift of righteousness, oh, to know the power of your risen life, to know you in your suffering, to become like you in your death, my Lord, so that you to, so with you to live and never die, Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. David knew the truth of that. Paul knew the truth of that. How sad that pride come in the way of Uzziah realising to its full extent just how great God was. I don't believe for one second that Uzziah drifted away from God and went to a lost eternity. This man truly, I believe, loved and trusted God. But how sad his relationship with God in the later years become where one where his eyes dropped from trusting in God. Rather than turn his eyes on God and keep him there, his eyes had been moved aside to the things of this world. He put his trust no longer completely in his God like he did. He didn't walk as close with God. His later years were not years of a close relationship with God like it had been at the start. It's so important that we not only turn our eyes on Jesus, but that we keep our eyes on Jesus. So we pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for the wonderful truths of your word. We thank you for the amazing way in which you took this king who trusted in you. And through him you did such great things to your people. And yet, Lord, the world's measurement of success is not ours. It's not yours. Because the truth is the most successful person in this world is still a sinner. And we still have to let go of our pride and we still have to trust you to be our saviour. And when we fail, when we slip, and we all do, Lord, we need to humbly come back to you in repentance. And again, ask your forgiveness. Because you have promised that if you confess our sins, you will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Lord, keep us humble. Keep our eyes fixed on you. Lord, our pride may never stop us. Listening to your voice, responding to your voice and staying close to you. For Jesus' sake alone. Amen.